The Civil War was over. All across the land, mothers and fathers buried their sons, wept, and tried to forgive the enemy now that all were once again pledging allegiance to the same flag. White Southerners were angry and confused. Their elegant Southern lifestyle had been destroyed. Journalist Sidney Andrews described Charleston, South Carolina. A city of ruins, desolation and vacant houses of rotting wharves, deserted warehouses and grass-grown streets. That is Charleston. The beauty and pride of the city are dead. A generation of white Southern men had been decimated. Those who came home brought wounds with them. In 1866, the year after the war's end, Mississippi spent one-fifth of its revenues on artificial arms and legs for returning veterans. Their homes, their farms, and livestock were gone, and now their widows were forced to pick up the pieces. We had no cattle, hogs, sheep, or horses, or anything else. The barns were all burned, chimneys standing without houses, and houses standing without roofs or doors or windows. Northerners were angry, too. The South had started the Civil War, and many thought it should be punished. Pennsylvania Congressman Thaddeus Stevens called the rebel leaders traitors and said that they ought to be hanged. Four years of bloody and expensive war waged against the United States by 11 states. We hold it the duty of government to inflict punishment on the rebel belligerents and so weaken their hands that they can never again endanger the Union. Four million black Southerners were now freed men and freed women. What were they to do now? Where were they to go? Isaiah Wears was a prominent black spokesperson. Let no man think we ask for people's pity or commiseration. What we do ask is fairness and equal opportunities in the battle of life. We are friends of our country. We have fought to defend her. Let us have the same chances as those who have fought against her. But as Frederick Douglass observed, Southern blacks had major obstacles before them. A former slave was free from the individual master, but the slave of society. He had neither money, property, nor friends. He was free from the old plantation, but he had nothing but the dusty road under his feet. To some extent, freedom for former slaves just meant getting out from under all the injustices of slavery, no longer being whipped, no longer being ordered about by whites, no longer having their families broken up, having access to education, being able to move about freely. All those regulations of slavery would no longer apply. But they also saw freedom as incorporation into American society. They wanted the right to vote. They wanted equality before the law. And many of them also thought land should come with freedom. No longer being dependent on whites for their livelihood, but having that autonomy that came with land ownership. So their notion of freedom was a very expansive thing, a real change in all the aspects of their lives. Millie Freeman was a former slave. It seemed like it took a long time for freedom to come. Everything just kept on like it was. 
We heard that lots of slaves was getting land and some mules to set up for themselves. I never knowed any what got land or mules or nothing. The reconstruction of the South got off to a good start. The passage of the 13th Amendment in late 1865 made slavery permanently unconstitutional. The Freedmen's Bureau, begun back under Abraham Lincoln, now distributed food, clothing, and shelter to black people all across the South. And it helped open schools for former slaves. But unlike Lincoln, the new president, Andrew Johnson, wasn't interested in former slaves. He was a Southerner and a Democrat and had been a slave owner himself. In February 1866, he vetoed an expansion of the Freedmen's Bureau and then looked the other way as Southern leaders instituted new black codes that restricted the freedom of black people. At the same time, he called for the welcoming of white Southern leaders back into the national government. This is a country for white men. And by God, as long as I am president, it shall be a government for white men. I cannot take the position that a state which attempted to secede is out of the union. I shall be in favor of the states resuming their former relations to the government in all respects. President Andrew Johnson basically gave the white South a free hand in organizing new government. Didn't give blacks any rights and said, okay, Southern whites can form new governments. And these new governments, passed these black codes to regulate the freedom of the former slaves. And basically, they tried to put them in a condition as close to slavery as possible, using the law to force blacks to go back to work on the plantations. They didn't have civil rights. They couldn't go to court. They couldn't testify. They couldn't vote. The black codes try to make the status of the former slaves that of dependent plantation laborers under the control of the white population. Encouraged by President Johnson's strong support, Southern whites began reinstating many of their old leaders, electing former high-ranking Confederate officers to the U.S. House and Senate. An outraged Congress, where Republicans outnumbered Democrats by almost four to one, refused to seat them. Instead, they passed the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, effectively nullifying the Black Codes. On March 27th, President Andrew Johnson vetoed the bill. I am right. I know I am right. And I am damned if I do not adhere to it. The only way a vetoed bill can become a law is if two-thirds of Congress overrides the veto. In April 1866, two-thirds did. It was the first time in American history that an important piece of legislation was passed over a president's veto. Carl Schurz was a Republican activist. The first gun of the war between the president and Congress was fired. It declared that the reconstruction of the late rebel states was the business not of the president alone, but of Congress. The Republicans in Congress who opposed President Johnson were led by Thaddeus Stevens. Stevens believed that the Southern states should not be admitted back into the Union until blacks were given the vote land and guarantees of equality under the law. And he called for a total restructuring of Southern society. The foundation of their institutions must be broken and relayed, or all our blood and treasure has been spent in vain. In 1866, Congress wrote the 14th Amendment. It was the most important change made to the Constitution since the Bill of Rights. And it said that the states must provide equal protection under the law to all their citizens. No government can be free that does not allow all its citizens to participate in the formation and execution of her laws. Every other government is a despotism. In 1867, Congress took charge of Reconstruction, removing it from President Johnson's hands. It forcibly divided the South into military districts, then passed a sweeping reform bill. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 required each Southern state to write a new state constitution that reflected the amended U.S. Constitution. And it said that while many former Confederate leaders could not vote, all black men could. The act was widely embraced, as Harper's Weekly reported. 
Though the president sees in it the destruction of the Constitution and the end of civil liberty, the loyal American people see in it the salvation of the Constitution and the beginning of civil liberty. That is the meaning of the Reconstruction Act. For the first time in American history, blacks were now elected to political office. 16 African Americans were elected to Congress, representing almost every state of the former Confederacy. And in Mississippi, Hiram Revels became one of two black U.S. senators, taking the seat of the former Confederate president, Jefferson Davis. The day he was sworn in, the Senate galleries were packed, as a Philadelphia newspaper noted. Never since the birth of the Republic has such an audience been assembled under one single roof. It embraces the greatest and the least American citizens. As Hiram Revels walked down the aisle, everyone stood. Then slowly but steadily, people began to cheer. President Johnson was furious at Congress for boxing him in and taking away much of his power. By now, his opponents were calling him the dead dog of the White House. Within a period of less than a year, Congress has attempted to strip the executive department of its essential power. I have been abused. I have been slandered. I have been maligned. Johnson especially opposed Congress's Reconstruction Act, as Charles Nordoff of the Evening Post sarcastically editorialized. He expressed the most bitter hatred of the measure in all its parts, declaring that the white people of the South, poor, quiet, unoffending, harmless, were to be trodden underfoot to protect. He is a pig-headed man with only one idea, a bitter opposition to universal suffrage. In 1867, disgusted with Johnson's attitudes, the Republicans in Congress decided to get rid of him. For two months, the House of Representatives debated. Finally, House members voted to impeach Andrew Johnson. Impeachment of me for violating the Constitution? Damn them! Have I not been struggling ever since I have been in this chair to uphold the Constitution, which they trample underfoot? Now the matter went to the Senate. Only they could try a president. Thaddeus Stevens was one of those who presented Congress's case. I accuse him in the name of the House of Representatives of having perpetrated a foul offense against his country. He has sought to convert a land of freedom into a land of slaves. This people have put the chief of traitors on trial and now demand judgment of his misconduct. If President Johnson were convicted of high crimes and misdemeanors, he would be thrown out of office. On Saturday, May 16th, the vote began. As expected, all the Democrats voted not guilty. Republican after Republican voted guilty. But behind the scenes, Johnson had been making deals with several Republican senators in return for the promise not to vote for impeachment. The final tally was 35 to 19, just one vote short of the total needed for conviction. President Johnson would remain in office. In 1869, the year after Andrew Johnson's acquittal, Congress passed the 15th Amendment. It gave black men the right to vote all across the country. In the South, social reforms were now spreading quickly. Black children were enrolling in 4,000 new public schools across the South. At least nine black colleges were opened. State legislatures were being integrated. It was a civil rights revolution, and it was forced on the South by the Republican-controlled Congress, as Carl Schurz explained. The Republic emancipated the slaves and promised them freedom forever. The protection of their rights is therefore a matter of duty. This duty will present itself again and again in legislation directly interfering with the southern states. 
for the Southern people, deluded by false hopes, are still struggling to restore the old order of things. Furious with the North for interfering in its society, Southern hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan began waging war on former slaves. Lynchings, rare before the Civil War, now became increasingly common. A Southern black man named Ben Johnson witnessed one of the Klan's crimes. It was a cold night when the Ku Kluxes come and drugs Ed and Cindy out of bed. They carried them down in the woods and whooped them. They throws them in the pond. Cindy ain't been seen since. Black citizens of Frankfort, Kentucky, sent a petition to Congress. We believe you're not familiar with the Ku Klux Klan's riding nightly over the country and in the county towns, spreading terror wherever they go by, robbing, whipping, ravishing, and killing our people without provocation. We have been law-abiding citizens, pay our tax, and in many parts of the state, our people have been driven from the polls, refuse the right to vote. In 1869, the Civil War hero, Ulysses S. Grant, became president. Unlike Johnson, Grant cared deeply about American blacks. And with his support over the next years, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Outlawing discrimination in hotels, theaters, and amusement parks, it was the last great legislation of Reconstruction. But just a year later, Grant's successor, Rutherford B. Hayes, ordered federal soldiers to be pulled out of the South. He said he believed the promises of Southern whites, that they would protect black rights. My judgment was that the time had come to put an end to bayonet rule, to wipe out the color line, to abolish sectionalism and bring peace. The army was withdrawn because I believed it a wise thing to do. But the Southern promises proved worthless, and no one was left there to enforce civil rights for African Americans. Reconstruction was over. Reconstruction was a great opportunity to really build a new society in the South from the ashes of slavery, and to, for the first time, really bring African Americans fully into the realm of American freedom. You might say that the amazing thing is that it was tried at all just two or three years after the ending of slavery. It didn't succeed, it was overthrown, a new system of white supremacy was enforced in the South. It left to the next century, really, this to work out this question of whether there is going to be a racial boundary around the concept of freedom in American life. In 1883, the Supreme Court made a fateful decision they voted to nullify the Civil Rights Act of 1875. That meant that from now on, there could once again be whites-only hotels, restaurants, barber shops, and theaters. Black leader Henry McNeil Turner knew he had been betrayed by the nation's highest court. It was a hard task to get an enactment through Congress that contemplated anything like civil rights. Now, a Republican Supreme Court has declared the whole thing null and void, leaving the Negro in a condition compared with which the serfs of Russia are lords. I have not deserted the Republican Party. The Republican Party has deserted me and seven million of my race. And an aging Frederick Douglass, now a public official in Washington, expressed his disgust. Men talk about the Negro problem. There is no Negro problem. The problem is whether American people have loyalty enough, honor enough, patriotism enough to live up to their own constitution. We Negroes love our country. We fought for it. We ask only that we be treated as well as those who fought against it. The color line in America applied also to trains, which increasingly separated passengers on the basis of race. In 1892, a 30-year-old black man named Homer Plessy was arrested for sitting in a whites-only railroad car. Arguing that his civil rights had been violated, 
a citizens committee took his case all the way to the Supreme Court. The justices listened to the arguments in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson, and in 1896, they made a ruling. Justice John Marshall Harlan wrote in favor of Homer Plessy. In view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. But Harlan's was a lone voice on the court and all the other justices voted against Plessy. Justice Henry Billings Brown wrote the decision that spoke for the majority. The 14th Amendment calls for the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social equality or a commingling of the races. What this meant was that though the races were equal before the law, local laws could prevent people of different races from mingling. In other words, if public facilities were equal, they could be separate. And so the age of legalized segregation began. The Ohio legislator, Benjamin Arnett, described the effect of the court's ruling. I have traveled in this free country for 20 hours without anything to eat, not because I had no money to pay for it, but because I was colored. Other passengers of lighter hue had breakfast, dinner, and supper. In traveling, we are thrown in Jim Crow cars denied the privilege of buying a berth in the sleeping coach. This foe of my race stands at the schoolhouse door and separates the children by reasons of color and deny to those who have a visible admixture of African blood in them the blessings of a graded school and equal privileges. Over a period of just 30 years, the opportunity for freedom opened up by the Civil War had been lost. W.E.B. Du Bois summed up the tragic failure of the era. The slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back again toward slavery.